Hello, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be discussing arthropods, and I would like to apologize in advance, but there's probably going to be a lot of information this one, so it might last a little long. Um, as you can see in front of you, um, arthropods have a lot of different subphylums, from extinct trilobites to chelicerates, myriapods, crustaceans, and hexapods. Mm -hmm. um, and each one of these um, subphylums has different classes and words within it that have lots of different common animals we're going to learn more about. Um, some general characteristics shared from arthropods. Um, the phylum arthropod contains over three-fourths of all known species in the world. Um, the main characteristic you need to know about is the exoskeleton, which is a protective layer surrounding their bodies made of protein and chitin. Um, their joints provide flexibility, um, and there's a sequence of molts um, that happens along their body to allow for growth. Other characteristics, um, they are coelomate protostomes with well-developed organ systems. Um, they have complete digestive tracts with open circulatory systems. Um, they are segmented, and they're usually um, three different segments, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen that can sometimes be fused. Um, you see all modes of feeding um, from carnivores, omnivores, all the way down to scavengers and parasites. Um, the size can vary in arthropods. You can have significantly large arthropods like the Japanese spider crab, which can reach four feet in length or four meters in length, or the follicle mite, which is less than a millimeter in length. Um, there are four subphyla within the phylum of arthropods. Um, the first subphylum is myriapods. Um, those are centipedes and millipedes. Next subphylum is hexapoda, which are insects. Um, chelicerates are spiders, scorpions, and ticks. And then crustaceans are lobsters, crabs, barnacles, and so on. Um, you can see the relationship here. We will start with the chelicerates and myriapods. Um, and then talk about crustaceans and hexapods later on. Um, two important body parts to understand first before we get going are the appendages and the mouth parts. Appendages can take one of two forms um, and some basic vocab words you need to know here. Uh, uniramous appendages end in one single point like we see um, in this B leg here and in one point here on this leg. Compare that to this crawdad's um, appendages, where each single one ends in two points, one, two, one, two, one, two, so on. That's called biramus. Uniramus appendages, biramus appendages. Um, and mouth parts, a little bit more complex, but two of the most common mouth parts are either called chelicerae or mandibles. Mandibles, we can see here on the grasshopper, they are meant to chew and crush food, while chelicerae are meant to pierce um, and sometimes grasp food. Um, chelicerae are what spiders have, mandibles, or what a lot of insects have. Um, so arthropods, very successful phylum. There's a reason why they make up over three-fourths of all known living species. Uh, they've survived over 600 million years, um, and some of them relatively unchanged. So I'm going to give you the top five reasons why. Um, the first one is that there's a versatile exoskeleton. It is protective, um, it's jointed, it provides mobility, um, and it still allows them to grow into their size. Um, the growth is controlled by hormones, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and environmental cues. Um, and you can see here just how layered and protective it is. This outside epicuticle is really, really hardened, while this inner layer um, can grow in size before it eventually needs to be shed. Um, reason number two, um, the segmentation and appendages allows for a division of labor, right? You can have appendages that are used for just sen sensing things. You can have appendages specialized for food handling or walking or swimming or whatever. And that division of labor allows for a more complex body. Um, metamorphosis um, allows for the larvae and adults to feed on different organisms and occupy different habitats. Think of just caterpillars and butterflies. Um, not only are they in different areas, they're avoiding competition with the young and adults, and they are eating different foods. 
Um, fourth reason is that air can be piped directly to the cells for increased um, oxygen use. Um, having an, um, a more complex body and more complex sensory system generally means um, that there's a higher need for oxygen in some of these animals. And so um, the body of a lot of these animals allows for oxygen to just be pumped directly to tissues and not have to go to like a central lung. Um, and then five highly developed sensory organs from complex eyes to um, touch, smell, hearing, balance, and chemical reception um, that is better than any other animal we've talked about so far to date. So jumping now into specific subphylums in arthropods. All right, so on to subphylum chelicerate. Um, they are named for their mouth parts. So they all have chelicerate mouth parts and lack mandibles. Um, all chelicerates also have six pairs of appendages. The chelicerate count is one, pedipalps are used for mating, that's two, and then there's four pairs of walking legs. Um, most suck liquid from their prey instead of like crush the prey um, and digest it that way. Examples are spiders, horseshoe crabs, sea spiders, ticks, scorpions, and so on. Um, we can see here, here are the sea spiders. Um, this is a horseshoe crab. Here's a tick, which counts as an arachnid, um, which also is in the same um, order as spiders and scorpions. Um, we've seen the horseshoe crab before. We learned about their blue blood. Um, so here's just a little picture. You can see the six, pair, or the six pairs of appendages, which are the chelicerae, the pedipalps, and the four sets of walking legs here. Um, same with the sea spider here. Um, you can see all the parts of, and the same appendages here as well. Um, but talking specifically now about class arachnida, um, their body structure or their bodies are divided into two distinct um, areas. There's a cephalothorax, which is a fusion of the head and thorax, and an abdomen. Um, the cephalothorax is where all of the appendages are attached to, um, while the abdomen stores most of the internal organs. Um, most are predators, and they have things like claws and fangs and poison glands and stingers. Um, and the pedipalps of males can be modified, sometimes elaborately, for sperm transfer. Um, just taking you through the body parts, this first part where all the eyes and the appendages are attached, that's the cephalothorax, that's the head and middle region. Um, and then this is the abdomen where most of the other internal organs are. Um, you can see all of the parts we talked about. Um, first off, they're all uniramous appendages. Here's the chelicerae, that's one pair. Pedipalps two, and then four pairs of walking legs for eight legs total. Um, most are pretty harmless to humans, and that's a big thing to get kind of out of the way right away. Some spiders have venom um, and can cause pain or death in humans, but that's very, very rare. Um, more often, um, the ones that can harm you are probably the smaller ones, like ticks and mites, which can carry diseases. Um, the Example orders we're going to talk about um, are Arane, which are spiders, Acare, which are ticks, Scorpionidae, um, which are scorpions, and Opalenes, which are daddy long legs. So let's just take a little bit of time and talk about each one of those. Um, so the order Arane for spiders, there are approximately 40,000 different species of spider. Um, their bodies consist, again, of the cephalothorax and the abdomen with the chelicerae. and the end of the chelicerae, they have terminal fangs that can sometimes um, secrete a poison. Um, and the four walking legs terminate in claws. Um, all are predaceous, mostly on insects. Um, and how it works is um, the walk-along um, use their chelicerae to inject venom into their prey. Um, the venom then liquefies the inside of whatever their prey is, and then the spider basically digests those tissues and it sucks up that liquid into its stomach. Um, so it actually, if you think about it, it's super interesting, right? It um, injects its prey with venom, liquefies and digests it there, and then sucks up all of the nutrients into its stomach. Um, spiders have a unique respiratory system called book lungs. 
um, where air enters through little slits in the side of their body. And there's a tracheal system um, that can transport air directly into their tissues and blood through little openings called spiracles. Um, they have an excretory system, um, which again works like all other excretory systems where it gets rid of extra waste in the body. Um, you can see just a few of the parts here. Um, here are parts of the um, excretory system, silk glands down here next to the spinnerets. Um, you can see how almost all of the organs are here in the abdomen, and there's just a few um, cardiovascular organs here um, in the cephalothorax. Um, most spiders have eight simple eyes, um, which can detect movement pretty well, but don't form images great. Um, so overall, pretty poor vision, uh, but they do have sensory hairs on their body that can detect air currents, um, web vibrations, and other stimuli. So even though they don't see as well, um, they still can detect things around them with those stimuli hair. Um, and web spinning habits of spiders are fascinating. Um, it's critical for their survival. Um, you can take a whole course on this, it's so interesting. But let's just talk basics here. Um, each spider has two or three pairs of spinnerets, which contain little microscopic tubes that run into the silk glands of their body. Um, the silk glands contain a liquid scleroprotein, um, which consists of insoluble proteins like elastin and collagen. Um, and that secretion hardens as it's excluded from the spinnerets, right? And that's what turns into little silk threads. Um, these silk threads are really strong um, and can be stretchy. But actually, the key thing is um, a spider has the ability to make different types of, types of webs. They can make webs that are really, really strong but not stretchy or webs that are really stretchy but not very strong or any combination in between. Um, and that silk can be used for things like um, making webs, obviously. Sometimes they line burrows, wrap their egg sacs, or wrap prey with their webs. Um, and we can see why here that spiders have the ability to make different types of webs. They have six different glands, so different, six different silk glands in their body that leads to um, three different spinnerets. Right, and so those silk glands, um, depending on which one is releasing which protein, can make different types of webs for the spider to utilize. Um, here's an example of an extreme situation when spiders can get into a field um, and build webs all over the field. Um, and so this, this guy in 2001, 2002, um, he goes out into his farm um, looks outside and thinks there's like snow or frost um, on his crops. He goes outside and realizes there's spider webs all over his property because there were literally like millions of different spiders that had used his ground for making their nests here. Reproduction in spiders. Um, male store sperm in pedipalps and mating generally involves inserting the pedipalps into the female's genital openings. Um, oftentimes there's a courtship ritual where the male has to impress the female. Um, sometimes if the female is hungry, yes, the female will devour and eat the male, um, but it's not always and it depends on the species. Um, but once mating does happen, the eggs develop into a cocoon, um, in the web or are carried by the female around. And then young hatch in about two weeks or so and they molt um, before leaving the egg cocoon. Um, so they grow a little bit of size. We can see here, here's a wolf spider with its egg sac and it carries it around. And here's a black widow um, with its egg sac stuck in its web, right? Either way, they're being protected here. So a key question is, are spiders dangerous? Um, and the general answer is where you live, there's really only two dangerous types of spiders. There's a whole bunch of scary looking spiders. I'm not going to dispute that. But in terms of dangerous that can do you harm, there's really only two. Um, tarantulas, you know, most people are scared of them because they're big, but they rarely bite and their bite's not dangerous. But the black widow and the brown recluse can be dangerous. 
Um, the Black Widow has a venom that acts as a neurotoxin. Um, if you're bit multiple times by a Black Widow spider, it could potentially kill you. But the most dangerous spider um, in the area where we live is the brown recluse because the brown recluse spider has a venom that actually destroys tissue around the bite. And so if you get bit by a big enough brown recluse or if you get bit by one that's like multiple times in an area, it can eat away at the muscle tissue in your body and actually cause the skin to like divot. Um, and there are some pretty dangerous um, and gross pictures out there if you're ever interested. But if you ever find yourself moving to um, Australia or South America, that's where you run into the, some of the more dangerous and aggressive animals. Um, so here's the Black Widow. We can tell it's Black Widow by this um, red hourglass shape on its body. Um, and then this is the brown recluse. Um, hopefully you never get close enough to a brown recluse to see this, but what you actually see on the body is if you look at this dark brown portion right here, it is actually shaped like a violin. And that's the way you can tell brown recluse versus other types of brown spiders, like a wolf spider or something like a trapdoor spider. Um, again, tarantula, big, hairy, not really dangerous. All right, on to our next order um, of scorpions. There are approximately um, 1,400 different species of scorpion worldwide. Most are nocturnal, feeding on insects and spiders. Um, generally, they are sa sand dwellers and locate their prey by little um, hairs on their legs and detecting changes in the surface. Um, their appendages are attached to the cephalothorax. Um, they have medial, so middle, and lateral eyes. Um, there's a pre-abdomen area that has seven segments and a post-abdomen segment or post-abdomen area, which has a long, slender tail of about five segments that ends in its stinging apparatus. Um, most scorpions fluoresce when exposed to UV lights. That's why if you've ever gone on YouTube and watched somebody um, in the desert, like at night, oftentimes they'll carry a UV flashlight with them so they can see scorpions. Um, the stinger is on the last segment. It has a venom um, that can vary from like mildly painful to dangerous, depending on the species of scorpion we're talking about. Um, sometimes they perform complex mating dances. Uh, generally, they are either oviviviparous or viviparous and produce somewhere between one and a hundred young. And gestation in this, um, in scorpions compared to spiders, can be from several months to a year, so a lot longer. Um, here's an example of an emperor scorpion and all of its young here on its back. Um, this is called a whip scorpion. Um, I'll show the video. I'll make the little Google Doc with all the videos here. But a whip scorpion is kind of like a spider scorpion hybrid, um, where instead of having a stinger at the end of its body, it can actually secrete a liquid that's pretty acidic. Um, and it um, can use that liquid to either hunt or um, get away from predators. Next up is order opilones, which are the harvest men. Um, harvest men are also known as daddy long legs. There are about 5,000 different species worldwide. Um, this is not to be confused with the daddy long leg spider. Um, so I'll show you a difference picture in a second. Um, unlike spiders, the abdomen and the cephalothorax join pretty broadly, so they don't pinch together. So their body's more like rectangular. Um, they can actually use lose most of their eight legs without ill effect. Um, I've seen videos of daddy long legs with like just three legs hanging on and surviving. Um, their chelicerae are pincer-like. Um, they can bite humans, but it's not very common. Um, but they are not venomous to humans um, because most of them are scavengers. Um, and they have two eyes instead of eight like you would see in spiders. Um, again, not to confuse with the daddy long leg spiders, which can bite, um, but aren't dangerous or venomous to humans. So here's a comparison. Here's the harvest men or the daddy long legs or the opiolenes. Um, and then here is the daddy long leg spider. Um, again, difference body more broadly joined while well, this one pinches off two eyes instead of eight. 
Um, these ones can lose limbs. Um, they don't make webs. That's another big one. Oftentimes they live under logs or um, on the ground. Um, well, these ones live high up in corners, make webs, um, contains a venom, but not dangerous to humans. Um, last order for chelicerates are order Akari, which are ticks and mites. Um, medically and economically, these are the most important arachnids. Um, there are about 30,000 different species that have been described, but there are probably more out there because they can be tiny and hard to find. Uh, most mites are less than one millimeter long, and ticks can range up to about two centimeters in size. Um, there's generally a complete fusion of the cephalothorax and abdomen and no signs of external segmentation. Um, the mouth parts on the tip of a little segment of their body called a capitulum, um, and the chelicerae are on that little capitulum, and you'll see um, in some of the images what that looks like. Uh, adult mites and ticks can possess four pairs of legs, but the larval stages vary. They don't get their full four sets of legs until they are adults. Um, here's a wood tick. We can see the four sets of legs. This little protruding part right here, that's the capitulum. Same here. Um, this is a red velvet mice. Uh, uh, mite. Um, common mites, there's the house dust mite, which cause allergies all over a house. Um, spider mites. Um, they're a pretty important agricultural pest and can suck out plant nutrients. Um, chiggers, which their larval stage feeds on dermal tissues, causing skin irritations. Um, and if you scratch it off but leave the feeding tube, that can cause more irritation for a couple of days. Um, there's the common hair follicle mite, which is harmless, but sometimes can cause mild dermatitis. So these, honestly, you probably don't want to know this, but they live all over your body in the little hair follicles. They're very tiny. Um, there's like common ones that live in your eyelashes, um, like this right here. They just feed off the oil in your eyelashes. Try not to think too hard. In fact, it kind of made my eyes itchy right now. Um, the human itch mite. Um, this was popular in World War II because of crowded conditions um, and it caused what was known as scabies because people were living in close quarters. The human itch mite in this case could just jump from one person to the next and cause this intense itching. Um, a little bit about ticks. Um, ticks are the second premier disease vector in the world. So they pass on the second most diseases in the world after mosquitoes. Um, they can carry Lyme disease and we'll talk um, a different day about Lyme disease and the effect it can have on people. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, Texas cattle fever. Each one of these is a different thing, a bacteria, a protozoan, but the tick acts as the thing that passes on that disease. Um, you can just see here, here's the tick carrying the Texas cattle fe fever. Um, yeah. Last here, um, we're going to talk about myriapods. Uh, myriapod means many-footed, and there are two classes. Chilopoda are for centipedes, and diplopoda are for millipedes. Um, centipedes, or chilopodas, are found under logs, bark, stones. They are carnivores, unlike millipedes. Um, they eat other um, insects, worms, um, and sometimes they can get bigger things, um, like reptiles, birds, and so on. Um, they have mandibles. That's why they're not chelicerae, they're myriapods. Um, centipedes have one pair of legs on each segment except for the first and the last two. Um, there are a lot that are harmless to human, but there are a few large tropical and desert species like we saw the other day that can be pretty dangerous. And there are about 3,000 different species worldwide. Um, you can see here, here's a giant centipede um, from the Amazon. Um, and this is what the head looks like. These are the poison claws. Um, if you remember watching the video the other day, he had to pin the head so that the poison claw wouldn't get him. Um, it can be pretty dangerous. And in this picture, you can see why um, it can be pretty dangerous um, trying to capture a centipede because it's hard to tell where the head actually is because um, the head region and the tail region have been modified to look exactly like each other. 
Um, it's been said that being stung by a centipede is similar to a wasp sting. So if you've ever been stung by a wasp, you kind of know what to expect there. Um, their head has one pair of antennae, um, and there are eyes on either side of the head. Uh, reproduction in centipedes, most have separate sexes. They lay eggs and guard them, so they're oviparous. Um, the young resemble the adults, and they don't go through metamorphosis, so the young are just tiny versions of them. Um, and each time they molt or grow, they add more legs and segments. So it takes about 10 molts to get to full adult size. Um, and here's an example of the molting, right? So getting rid of the old exoskeleton here, um, crawling out of it. And this is the new one underneath. Um, let's compare that with diplopoda or millipedes, which means double-footed. There are 10,000 different species of them. Um, they are less active than centipedes. They're slower. They walk more gracefully. There's less of a wiggling motion. Um, most are decomposers, so they eat decaying plant material. Um, their main defense mechanism is to roll into a coil, um, but some also produce a toxin or repellent fluid um, from special glands on their body that contain hydrogen cyanide in it. Um, you can see here what a tropical millipede looks like, um, and you can see in general, here's the antennae, eyes, mandible here to crush their food, um, and then walk. Um, the first few segments only have one leg, and then you get um, past the first few segments, and each one is double-footed. Um, they have cylindrical bodies um, with 25 um, to more than 100 segments, right? So the older the centipede, or the older the millipede is, the more body segments they have. Um, the thorax is the first four segments, um, each containing only one pair of legs, while the abdomen is the rest of the body, which contains the two sets of legs. Um, simple eyes, simple pair of antennae and mandibles. Reproduction, um, they have special copulatory organs, and after copulation, female lays an egg in a nest and guards them. Um, the larvae only have one pair of legs uh, per segment, and as they molt, they gain more legs. Um, and again, it takes about seven to 10 molts to reach adult size. So that was our overview um, of chelicerates and myriapods. Uh, next time we talk about arthropods, which won't be till after break, we'll talk about crustaceans and hexapods. Thank you for watching.